Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Gordon Fowler, who is the manager of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Program of Nuclear Safety Assistance to Nuclear Regulatory Agencies in Ukraine and Russia. And he'll be speaking on Chernobyl globalization of nuclear safety. I'm Gordon Fowler. Um, I just wanted to um, mention for those, uh, as John, D John Dunn uh, famously said, no man is an island, and so no nuclear program. Can you all hear me? I'm sorry, I'm not in front of the mic here. Is that okay, better? Uh, I, I'm not used to really a podium. Usually I'm sort of standing, walking around, but I'll, I'll uh, comply with the technological necessities here. Okay, no man is an island, and so uh, no nuclear program is strictly national, as we've learned from the Chernobyl site, for, from the Chernobyl accident. Um, as a result of the Chernobyl accident, 20 years later, there's been a noticeable growth in the internationalization of nuclear safety and by association nuclear regulatory activity, which is my, my beat. Uh, before the Ch Chernobyl accident, as we know, the Soviet nuclear industry was uh, isolated from the West. The West was isolated from it. And of course, within the Soviet Union, uh, certain el elements of the nuclear industry were also isolated among themselves. Uh, there was a distinct lack of communication, as we've heard earlier, uh, and secrecy in that, uh, that industry. And I will say, uh, incidentally, for those who want to know more about the accident itself, uh, probably a, a very poignant and detailed technical description is the book by uh, Gregory Medvedev uh, called the, uh, the Truth About Chernobyl, uh, which I have a copy of right down here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very gripping technical and fast-moving uh, account, which he wrote in the first year afterwards. And he's, a man who has a lot of technical nuclear knowledge of, of, of the period and of the personalities. Um, the, um, during, and he describes a lot of this kind of secrecy at the same time. The, the, the uh, electrical power of industry in the Soviet Union was one of uh, heavy uh, emphasis on uh, production of electri electrical power uh, at the expense of nuclear safety, of, of safety as, as a generalization, and of course we saw the ultimate outcome of that at the Chernobyl accident. Now, as we've heard earlier, uh, news of the accident couldn't be contained by the Soviets because it had been detected in Sweden, as we had heard, by a worker who was entering into the plant and it was detected on his person. At first, they saw, thought that that plant, which is Forsmark in uh, Sweden, had um, uh, had a problem itself, and so they evacuated all non-essential personnel from that site until they started tracing back the, uh, the radionuclides that were coming over and actually traced it back to Chernobyl, and essentially they and then the rest of the Western world started called the, the Soviets on, on, uh, on their silence. Uh, the, uh, this was the ultimate and ultimately successful test, I believe, of Glasnost, which was an, a policy of openness that had just been um, formulated by the last premier of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, so my talk basically is, some of it's gonna sound a little bit repetitive. That's one of the things about coming in late in the afternoon is a lot of, some of the things that you were gonna mention have been mentioned before. However, I think that uh, for the sake of emphasis and also orientation, I don't think it's of much risk in doing some of this repetitive, uh, repeating some of the things you've heard before. I, w I want you to keep in mind as you hear uh, uh, my, uh, my story on roll here that we're talking about the globalization of nuclear safety. Some of the things I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be saying about the accident, about the international community's reaction, about uh, uh, the NRC, the assistance, has got that, that as sort of the ultimate outcome. So please think in terms of how the, the world technologically has become globalized, uh, in part because of what happened at Chernobyl. So I'm going to essentially cover two areas, uh, three or four areas here. The accident sequence very briefly, which was characterized, as we've heard, by operator error, and then subsequently we learned much more about our BMK design, and we found that that was a, a, a certainly equal contributor to, to the accident. Uh, the international awareness of the the initial international awareness of the accident was one of characterized by confusion at first, and it took some time for the world to sort of understand what went on and then to be able to react to it. Uh, it's a little reminiscent of a Katrina, you might say. 
you know, it happened. We, nobody's ready for it, and people have got to figure out how to organize themselves, and leadership set, uh, uh, structures have got to be set up before you can really mobilize action. Uh, then the systems programs started to uh, emerge from a variety of sources, and out of that grew a number of uh, universal safety concepts. So as we know, on April 25th, 1986, uh, the Ch Chernobyl Unit 4 was about to undergo a routine, uh, routine shutdown for maintenance. And usually when you have maintenance shutdowns of reactors, you're doing a variety of different kinds of tests, one of which was, in this case, to see whether a tur spinning turbine could run safety systems. Uh, this kind of test had actually been done a number of times before, uh, but there were a number of conditions in the reactor that were unsafe that should have been, by responsible people, noticed and corrected before they in engaged in the test. In fact, they started shut in order to overcome some of those uh, those conditions, they started turning off safety systems they, to bypass them. And of course, when, by turning them off, they've increased the risk and you dealt with l less experienced people in the control room without high level supervision uh, on site. Uh, but the t test began and then at 1.23 a.m., 30 sec 36 seconds into the test, the supervisor requested that the sh plant be shut down because he could see things beginning unstable. Power levels dropped dramatically uh, beyond which they should have. But four to six seconds after that, a shock was felt in the control room. Three seconds later, a second shock was felt and we had had what's known as a reactivity accident. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the reactor uh, got out of control through increasing levels of radioactive uh, of development radioactive increases. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning here that the RBMK, I'm not going to get into a technical discussion of the RBMK, but the RBMK is a unique type design which is inherently unstable. It gets out of control and it feeds on itself and gets more and more out of control. That's to be uh, to con contrasted with the so-called light water reactor or in the Soviet design, the VVER, and our, our design to the PWR, the pri pressurized water reactor. Fundamentally, it's a kind of reactor in which, it, as things get out of control, it tends to t shut itself down. So I just wanted to make sure we understood that there are two different kinds of reactor designs, and we're dealing with a fair, fairly unique design that is no longer going to be ma uh, made uh, in, in the world, but there are still a number uh, around. So as a result of that, um, we, oh, now I've got to go, I've just, Somehow I went back forward. Can I go backwards? In any case, there was, we had a nice pretty picture there. Yeah, that's okay, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, so the result of the second explosion was what you see there, and perhaps we've seen too many of these pictures uh, by, by now, but that's a rather dramatic uh, uh, outcome that happened in a matter of minutes after that second explosion took place. Uh, what happened was a, uh, to cause the accident was that there was a large what they call positive reactivity in the, in the core, which I just briefly explained. Uh, the power level increased dramatically to 100 times design power, totally out of control situation. There was a rapid steam buildup uh, to the point that it, there was an explosion, a steam explosion, which dispersed uh, core fragments and shield pieces. Uh, that shielding for the uh, reactor and a hydrogen explosion, which was probably the second shock. The emergency response was that uh, th after this happened, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the Pripyat, uh, Pripyat as you know, was the town where the, where the uh, plant families, plant operators, plant workers, and families lived, about two miles fr away from the plant, very, very close. We would never have a town that close to a reactor in this country. Uh, they were told to, to, to take shelter, basically not to leave their houses. Uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, however, uh, as a result of uh, some Moscow people coming in, they made decisions that uh, the, the Pripyat should be evacuated. They brought in buses and uh, uh, evacuated the, um, the people, and eventually there were 135,000 people evacuated. 
to, to distinguish the fire uh, and to control the radiation, helicopter, helicopters came in and dropped, and I'm more slung than dropped, 5,000 tons of, we've heard earlier, boron, lead, sand, clay, and dolomite. Uh, they couldn't really fly over the reactor, as we've heard, because the, the, the thermal plume and the radiation shine, as they call it, was highly dangerous. As a matter of fact, there was at least one, there were two helicopter pilots, as far as I know, killed. One was brought to this country for treatment, but he finally died. So they'd, they'd fly these helicopters around, and they kind of swing, uh, swing the, the, uh, their, their load around so that they wouldn't have to drop fly directly over, but they could swing it over onto the, uh, onto the site. So it was a lot of uncertainty as to how effective they were, uh, they were being. Uh, miners, as we heard before, tunneled underneath also the, uh, the, the, the reactor so that they could put um, liquid nitrogen in there, which would have the effect of cooling, cooling the reactor. And in, at the 10th day, it seemed to have had its effect because on the 10th day of the reactor, there was a dra dramatic drop in temperature, and essentially the fires were out by the 10th day. Uh, the uh, at, at the ra radiation uh, disposition of the, at the time, as we've heard, there was a number of wind shifts and some sp spotty rain here and there. Uh, Kiev was very fortunate because first the initial wind was uh, north-northwest, as you know, and when it shifted south, uh, the um, the heat island effect of the island of the of the city. That is because there's so, there's a the, the, the concrete absorbs heat and also the uh, there's a lot of electrical a lot of power consumption around a city. Uh, that man managed to make the, a lot of the radiation go around and over the city, so there was deposition south uh, downstream of the city, but uh, fortunately the city was pretty well spared of radiation. Uh, we heard earlier today, and this is a kind of a surprising statistic, that there's much explosion, and with all of that plume going around, uh, uh, spreading around, only 3% of the entire in uh, inventory in Curie's was actually released uh, from the reactor. The other 97% still remains in the reactor. Now at this stage, 20 years later, that, uh, that, that a lot of that radiation is pretty stable. Now we've heard about the water, and that's true. And, the, and there's dust in there, and that's true. But because, uh, because of the, um, the things like the elephant foot and the, and, and the way it's been uh, calcified or solidified, uh, there's a lot of, and because of the decay that's taken place, the radioactive decay 20 years later, it's a, it's a serious problem in there, but it ain't what it was 20 years ago. So I think that uh, th that's going to help the workers when they get to uh, building that, that, that shelter. It's, it, it's, the radioactivity is going to be a lot better understood and not quite as lethal. So here we had the reactor, and I, I was going to borrow somebody's... Um, Here, here we have uh, the, the reactor. This is uh, uh, units three and four before the accident. On the left side is the turbine hall. On the right side, you'll see in the center, it looks like a brickwork. That's actually the reactor, the graphite blocks. Uh, the vertical piece in there is the automatic loading machine, fuel loading machine. As we heard earlier, this is automatic loading. They load while they're in, uh, while the upper, the plant is in operation. And on either side, you can see these vertical tubes, and that's where the, the, the fuel is. Uh, 1,600 of those uh, fuel channels, uh, as somebody has said, the plumber's nightmare. Uh, so after the, um, after, oh, and the biological shield, if you'll notice, the, you see the brickwork, and then just above it, there's a, a, a long horizontal um, rectangle. Uh, before the black line. That, that's the, I thought it was 1,000 tons, apparently it's 3,000 ton biological shield above the reactor. And this is a representation of what it looked like after uh, the, uh, the accident occurred. You'll see that the core region, it says core region is empty. The black that goes down below that is the f fuel as it's been, uh, fuel lava as they say. So it's fairly stable because it's in lava form. Uh, the biological shield is sort of hanging there on the top of the uh, old core, and then you'll see the black 
pile to the right of that is where is, is fuel that had been pulled out, or, or let's say exploded out and landed on the flooring of the reactor and well mixed in with all of the, the sand and clay and dolomite that had been dropped from the helicopters. So on uh, April 28th, we t I heard I mentioned about the Swedish uh, worker coming out and they chased it back. The, as we know, the Soviets had initially designed there was a problem, but finally at 9 o'clock uh, that morning they did announce a, uh, they had a problem. Uh, the New York Times made a major headline story of the accident uh, saying that there had been a nuclear uh, disaster and there had been a, spread, a cloud spreading all over Europe. And uh, the Poles, hearing about this, uh, did an interesting thing. They uh, warned people to shun drinking milk. They brought their cows in, fed them under, under roofs, and effect. We heard a lot about uh, health effects this morning uh, and the, um, the, the incidence of thyroid. Why did, they, why did those children get thyroid cancer? Because they drank milk. Because the, the, lack of, the absence of announcing the problem by the Soviets meant that the cows stayed out in the grass ate the grass with the, uh, the, uh, the, the radiation, produced radioactive milk, and the children drank it. In Poland, Poland also had fallout. They brought the cows in. You don't hear of any unusual instance of, of, of thyroid cancer in, in Poland. The um, Kiev paper, however, on that same day, on the back page of the paper, had a brief notice about the accident uh, under a heading, Information of the Cabinet of Ministers, which I'm sure is the first thing people in the city look at every day. Um, so what did NRC do? NRC, uh, we heard about this through the newspapers in the same way. Now keep in mind, satellite communication was very, very, uh, um, very uh, new thing in those days, and of course there was no kind of systematized international reporting of incidents like this. I'll just tell you a little anecdote, if I might, about how we s plugged into the international uh, communication system. Uh, our we started out by getting some senior staff down to our what was called Incident Response Center, uh, which was in Bethesda, Maryland, and um, uh, we, our means of communication was basically telephone. Well, you couldn't get anything internationally through the telephone. But just so happened that right across the street is Sugar Lay Leonard's sports bar. Now, Sugar Lay Leonard, you know who he is, I guess. Boxer, very famous boxer. He, he, had a, he had bought into a satellite communication in order to bring in fights from around the world into his bar. So we, we, we rented out basically his bar 24 hours 7 in order to get as much international communications as we could uh, relating to this accident. We wanted to know what happened and to what extent that this reactor uh, accident would have any effect or any implications for our own designs. Because, um, I keep, somehow I just keep jumping forward. Anyway, uh, we didn't know anything about RBMK designs. Uh, the Soviets weren't telling us much, and even after the accident happened, uh, they weren't letting on. So we had to make inferences that we could by basically taking the readings that we had been learning about in the plume and tracing them back to perhaps the kind of design of a reactor that they, would, uh, that, that they had. Okay, we're at the IAEA response. I got ahead of me, myself here. So the first uh, organized reaction to the, uh, organized international reaction to the accident was the uh, meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency in October 1986. Uh, and there was reference to this, uh, this meeting, this conference uh, earlier today. Uh, 600 participants, which is a goodly number, came to uh, hear the Soviets describe uh, the accident. By this time, the word had gotten out. This was now six, uh, four months after the accident had taken place. And they were discussed two th matters. One was what the causes of the accident were, and the other it were issues of, uh, of international safety interest uh, to help uh, improve commu international communications if such an incident should take place again. Uh, it, it initially, as, a, as we know, the Soviets ascribed the, uh, the 
cause of the accident to being human error. And it's always, you know, the, the operator's fault. It's never the state's fault. It's never the system's fault. It's always the o operator who's got to go to jail. Uh, it was in subsequent meetings when we learned, we in the West learned more about the, the nature of the RBMK reactor that we recognized that it was really an interaction effect between incompetent operation, operations and a, a fundamentally flawed design. Uh, the, uh, it, it got to be pretty clear that international, uh, uh, that, that there could be another Chernobyl, maybe not as serious, but we recognize that uh, we, we can't, each nuclear pr program can't look w inward just within its own national borders. You have to look at what the implications are beyond your borders. In other words, an accident anywhere is an accident everywhere. And the in nuclear industries around the world were starting to recognize this too because you, you, you have too many Chernobyls over there, it's going to shut down our nuclear program over here. Uh, the, an example of the cross-border issues had to do with uh, the frictions that would develop between non-nuclear power countries such as Austria and nuclear power countries such as the Czech Republic. There's been an ongoing uh, serious um, f political friction between those two countries over the continuing operation of Temlin plant, which happened to be a Soviet design, but VVER, not RBMK design. And the other one that comes to mind is uh, the non-nuclear power Denmark next door to the nuclear power Sweden. And in fact, the, the political pressure in, uh, imposed by Denmark had the result of shutting down two, uh, two uh, plants right next door to Denmark, just across the river, uh, Barsenbach one and two. So the, it, 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 as a result of that conference, or during that conference, the IEA adopted, or the members of the IEA adopted a number of international safety measures. And this was a very significant meeting uh, and, and the subsequent ones because it really opened everyone's eyes up to the global aspects of nuclear, of, of nuclear power and its risks. Uh, international inspection teams were constituted to assess older plants, particularly in the former Soviet, in the Soviet Union. Uh, an event analysis and safety assessment program was developed using upgraded IAEA incident reporting system. And most significantly, the IEA members at the meeting adopted two international conventions. The Convention on the Early Notification of a Nuclear Accident, which is to report to the IEA on accidents with potential cross-border consequences. Um, and in fact, well, the second was a convention on the assistance of other countries in case of a nuclear accident that may have cross-border uh, cross consequences. Uh, we are very fortunate that that convention has not been invoked for nuclear power uh, purposes because we haven't had an accident uh, uh, that's gone, let's say, outside of a, of a site, you know, a Chernobyl accident. But that has been invoked for radiation uh, releases for in non, the non-power areas uh, on several occasions subsequently. Uh, the international community also adopted an emergency response system for sharing accident information, expanded health and environmental networks such as with the World Health Organization to include radiological information, addressed liability for transnational damage, nuclear damage in the case of an accident, by broadening existing conventions. Uh, this is still an ongoing debate. This is a very tough nut to crack, I might say. Uh, it systemized event reporting through an international nuclear event scale that was Andrew just uh, mentioned, or the INES. And, um, I, uh, and it also, the, uh, the World Association, the private sector got involved by creating the World Association for Nuclear Operators, which was initiated by what is known in this country as INPO, or the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, that sounds like a mouthful, but let me just remind you about Three Mile Island when, uh, after that happened, it looked like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was going to basically overwhelm the industry with, with thousands of regulations. And so the industry said, wait, we'll regulate ourselves in, in certain areas. And so there was this ne negotiation that went on, and INPO was essentially created as an industry industry-based watchdog group. Uh, and more recently, the IEA adopted the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which is a, um, 
establishes and promotes the principles of nuclear regulate of good nuclear regulation. Uh, this under this convention, all nuclear regulators meet three uh, once every three years to make reports on their experiences in nuclear regulation and to ask each other questions about them. This next slide is. Uh, the International Nuclear Event Scale, I'm just uh, showing this for illustrative purposes. It shows at the top, as Andrew was mentioning, uh, number seven. Uh, the, 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 the top is Chernobyl. So that sort of defines the upper, uh, upper range of, of a serious accident. Then you work down, there are several definitions of less, than, less significant accidents and then incidents and then a deviation which has no uh, no safety significance, but it might be a deviation from a technical specification. Now, let me just uh, mention, uh, in terms of the use of the internet, the INES, which has actually a, been a terrific uh, in, uh, innovation. In this case, you have all the various emergency uh, uh, emergency offices of, of regulatory agencies reporting into the IEA incidents that take place, and these are immediately dispersed to all other countries. Uh, there was one that just came in uh, on the 25th of, uh, of about three days ago, 25th of April. This was from the Kozladui nuclear power plant in which they uh, reported the inoperability of 22 out of 61 control rods. Well, that gets your attention because it was control rods not working at Chernobyl, which was partly the responsible for its, um, uh, its uh, the, the disaster that happened there. But in any case, this, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately that happened on, uh, it was reported on the 25th a few days ago. The incident took place, however, on March 1st. So <laughs> I don't know the full story here, but that does seem like a pretty big gap. But it's, so this is not a perfect system, but it, 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 it's, it's been workable. Uh, now the first, now, as I mentioned, I work for NRC, so I have to pull NRC into this. Uh, we, we've been involved in the, uh, the nuclear safety business with the, the Soviet Union first, the so former Soviet Union uh, subsequently, uh, in, in a pretty, uh, we were there sort of at the beginning, you might say. Uh, before the accident, we had a uh, commissioner who had spent time in Eastern Europe, and he was very interested, as, he had been very interested in nuclear safety in the, in the Soviet Union. So he had managed through the State Department to uh, get permission to have a reciprocal visit of high-level people uh, in, in late, got the approval in early 1986, and this trip was about to take place in the spring, but of course then the accident took place, it de delayed that trip, and the trip didn't actually take place until uh, March of 87. Uh, the, I guess the silver lining here is it gave them an opportunity then to visit uh, the Chernobyl uh, accident site, which was the first uh, foreign delegation to visit the site at that time. Uh, there was a reciprocal visit uh, that took place six months later uh, and the, hosted by uh, the chairman of the NRC at that time uh, for comparable uh, level people, comparable numbers, uh, and they traveled throughout the United States uh, and incidentally uh, visited Three Mile Island this was part of the reciprocity at the time. If you recall, during the Soviet period, reciprocity was a big deal. Uh, the principle of equivalence was that the you know, numbers of delegations had to be the same, the numbers in a delegation had to be the same, and the type of access had to be the same to facilities. So if we wanted to go to Chernobyl, they wanted to go to Three Mile Island. But of course, what they saw at Three Mile Island wasn't nearly as dramatic. Uh, these visits, led to uh, bilateral exchanges with the Soviet Union between 1988 and the breakup of the Soviet, Soviet Union in 1991 under the mouthful expression uh, the Joint Coordinating Committee on, Nucle on Civilian Nuclear Reactor Safety, which was set up April 1988, which was two years after the accident. This was un under joint, on the U.S. side, under joint NRC DOE management. And of course, it was with the with Moscow at that time because we were still it was the Soviet Union. So it was essentially Manadam and Kurchatov Institute, as well as their incipient regulator uh, uh, at the time. Uh, under the JCCNRS of the Joint Committee, there were technical exchanges through reciprocal working group visits. Uh, these working groups 
uh, where we, we, they travel here, we travel there, were uh, broken down into different kinds of re nuclear safety categories, uh, such as regulatory practices, safety analysis, radiation embrittlement of pressure vessels, fire safety, severe accidents, operational experience. Now, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, in Ukraine became independent. Now, uh, but they became independent sort of in name only at the, begin at the beginning because they really didn't have an infrastructure to run a country very successfully. And I won't speak any more broadly than in the nuclear area. They, their regulator was, their, their industry was run out of Moscow. Their regulator was a small inspection office here in, in Kiev, which was on the other side of the river. You know, you know, Kiev, downtown Kiev is where the election is, but if you get over there in the, in the Plains side, you know, not, that, that's not what you call, you know, the, the center of power. Well, that's where they were. Uh, they had, uh, but they had 16 reactors to operate, including the, uh, uh, the, 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 then I guess it was two left at uh, Chernobyl because one was shut down, two was shut down in 92, all for either economic or technical reasons, not because of people thinking RBMKs were unsafe. They were just shut down because of, uh, for, as I say, financial or technical reasons. Uh, the design and training institutes were in Russia. Most of the managers were Russian. Uh, and after the breakup, many of the managers went back to Russia either because of family ties or because the salaries were better. For example, in 1993, in the first three months, uh, Chernobyl lost 200 skilled and managerial employees, including a plant director. In the Chernobyl region, as we know, Pripyat had already been abandoned, and Slavudich had just, just finished being built uh, on the, on, into the east outside of the 30-kilometer zone. Um, and which I thought, something that I thought was interesting, that was m mentioned in one of the videos earlier, that uh, and this was a sort of cynical propaganda that, uh, you know, the, the unity of the Soviet Union is stronger than the atom, if you recall. Well, uh, as a demonstration of that, the Various uh, 15 republics were brought in to help design and fund and build uh, Slavutic. So if you go down to different parts of Slavutic, you'll find uh, uh, architectural heritage or traditions rep represented by various of the 15 republics. In the center of the city, for, and those who've been to Slavutic, and many of you have, you know that there's a large plaza in the center, and in the middle of the plaza, there is a very touching memorial to the 30-odd people who were killed in the immediate aftermath of the, um, of the accident. Uh, the nuclear regulatory body at that time, this is what I wanted to say, had, uh, was just a regional office. It had no legislative mandate. It was, uh, its inspectors uh, lived at the sites, as you know, these sites are very remote, and they have small towns that with about 40 to 60,000 people in them, like Pripyat. They're one-company towns. They don't, uh, ex except for te secondary, uh, uh, s secondary uh, in industries, primarily nuclear power is what they do. So these people probably have worked for the p power plant before they came, became regulators or inspectors. They might go back to the plant afterwards. They have wives, children, aunts and uncles who work at the plant. So you're talking about an inherent co conflict of interest between the inspectors and the um, uh, being between the inspectors and the plant people. Now, as to the independence, of course, the, uh, uh, the the regulatory agency was starting to get larger, partly under our tutelage, and I won't say just ours. There was it was an international effort. Uh, m many of those those people at working to Chernobyl had received lifetime doses. Of, uh, of, of radiation, as we'd heard earlier, and uh, could not go back and work in plants any further. So they were prime candidates to become regulators. They also had an increased sensitivity towards nuclear safety. Uh, so we got to know many of these people, and it was very touching. And there was one case in particular who's a guy named Alexei Anonenko, who is, heads the uh, emergency response division for the nuclear regulator in, in Ukraine. Uh, he was working, he was a, uh, sh on the shift of that, um, at, at Unit 4, the day before the accident took place, 
and that's when the, the, um, the, the test was supposed to take place was the day before. But they delayed it a day because there was a, one of the plants at Rivne was being shut down and to balance the plant, the dispatcher said, oh, you delay your, your shutdown uh, at Chernobyl because we, we've got a shutdown in Rivne. So they delayed the test for, by one day. If they hadn't do, done that, uh, Mr. Yananenko would have been there uh, during that test. So that's, it's pretty close to us, some of these people. Now, so in 1991, as we heard, it was, as you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. 1992, as Andrew was mentioning, uh, there was a flurry of activity to develop some sort of assistance programs uh, to the former Soviet countries. Uh, the, um, the, the Secretary of State uh, the United States made a, uh, a speech at Lisbon, Portugal in uh, February, which was really designed, it was like a Marshall Plan kind of, kind of thing. Nuclear aspects and energy aspects were just one part of a large panoply of ideas, which was designed to try to keep the Soviet Union or the independent states from backsliding into Soviet control. Uh, so there was a, six months of, of fast and furious efforts to try to get pro assistance programs together to present to the Soviets, or now to, excuse me, to the, to the now independent states. Um, the G7 announced uh, a, a multilateral assistance program in May uh, for the, in the nuclear area. One of the conditions was that the so-called unsafe reactors would be shut down, i.e. RBMKs, as well as older design of another design the VVER 440s. Uh, and uh, it turned out, of course, that the only successful effort, uh, the success was the uh, Unit 3 effort, and that was only because it was part of the large deal that was cut uh, in the 1995 Memorandum of Understanding, which Andrew mentioned earlier. Uh, as part of uh, the NRC's role in responding to the Secretary of State's uh, offer, we met with the Ukrainians in July and worked out a, a, a plan for transforming our working group relationship that we had developed over the previous three years into an assistance program. Now, uh, this, uh, this, these offers ended up by being agreements that were signed between uh, the, the, the US and Ukraine. Uh, and under this, in the nuclear safety area, DOE was, was uh, charged with upgrading, helping the Ukrainians upgrade the nuclear, the plants that they had, both RBMKs and short-term upgrades, I would say, because this, our policy was still to shut down the plants. But in the short term, until that happened, we had to make sure that they were safe. And that had to do with increasing the enrichment uh, and, and uh, reducing the void coefficient and so forth of the RBMKs. Um, the NRC then um, was charged with uh, helping Ukraine develop a viable, strong, independent regulator. Uh, and the working group projects became assistance projects. In addition, we uh, helped, helped design and to draft nuclear legislation, uh, helped them draft uh, regulations for licensing and inspection of nuclear power plants, developed state uh, standards for regulatory reviews, as well as uh, helped them uh, create uh, analytical capabilities. Okay, the, uh, as part of this plan, the idea was to try to get assistance programs to, to mesh up with each other, to become complementary. So on the, on the U.S. side, uh, we worked, tried to work closely with DOE to, to make sure that what we did with the regulator in terms of, of, of type of activity and timing corresponded with their efforts to help with the upgrades of, of the power plants. Uh, the uh, U.S. programs were coordinated with uh, the G7 programs, which were uh, going to be really um, uh, instituted through the European Bank and Reconstruction and Development, as well as the European Union, who developed a, another mouthful word, uh, TASIS, we know it as, uh, Technical Assistance for the Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, current status of the uh, NRC program is uh, we, we 
met with the Ukrainian regulators over 14 years, our 14th uh, annual meeting with the senior regulator here in, in Washington took place about three weeks ago. And we have the, uh, uh, the senior regulator and her, in this case it's a her, um, a delegation come over, meet with us on technical matters for a couple of days. They meet with all of our commissioners and our chairman. They meet at the State Department. They meet at the Department of Energy so that we have a, a kind of a holistic approach to our relationship in which we try to keep all the different levels of hierarchy kind of fully informed and, and involved in, in the pro process. Uh, a demonstration of the emerging maturity of the nuclear regulator in Ukraine is the fact that during that meeting that I just described, the chairman of the NRC signed a uh, what we call an arrangement for technical information and cooperation, exchange of technical information and cooperation. NRC has these arrangements with 38 other so-called mature regulators throughout the world. And we haven't had one with Ukraine because their, their, regu their reg uh, regulatory body has had a lot of evolution to go through. Uh, this is a sign of their emerging maturity. I will say that they are, have a, still a long way to go, but they, they, they have, uh, I heard, I, I think I heard earlier today that only 7% of the people in Ukraine believe that uh, nu nuclear, um, n nuclear power is safe in, in Ukraine. Um, of course, it depends on what kind of, where you're coming from, are you talking about you know, where we've come from or where we're going. But there is, there is clear, be, because of the legislative underpinning and because of the independence of the agency, it reports, the agency reports to the prime minister uh, that it, it, it is licensing, it's, it is licensing activities, it has a capable competence in its, in its technical service organization. Uh, when, they, when, they, uh, uh, when, when they inspect and they have inspection findings, they get the attention of the industry uh, they are licensing, and they have uh, they have certain access to the political system that they didn't have before. So when I say that they have coming of age, I mean that's where they've come from, not that there's a lo not a long way to go yet. Um, in addition, uh, we have a lot of high-level interest in Ukraine. We've had many uh, commission visits to Ukraine and to Chernobyl. So uh, in coming up to concluding here, uh, our approach to assist, assistance has been to strengthen the re regulator in all its various phases. So we don't concentrate just on Chernobyl or just on licensing or just on inspection. We want to see a competent, institutionalized, well-respected, well-funded, competent, technically competent organization. That's our role. And, but that's our role everywhere. We happen to be talking to Ukraine about Ukraine here because it's Chernobyl related, but we have similar activities going on with other countries as well, and all of this, plus the IEA, plus all the discussion like, such as we're having today, lead to a certain common set of expectations and standards uh, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, our method has been through technology transfer, through training, and the, the support of regulation development and international peer review. And I think the results I've, uh, I've just described, uh, I think that we're, we're getting somewhere. So um, in, in conclusion, the uh, Chernobyl accident exposed dissimilar safety cultures between the United States and the Soviet Union. But over our 20-year engagement, this has moved, our 20-year engagement has moved this Soviet culture closer to that of the West. And this engagement has led to a global approach to nuclear safety involving uh, more increasingly importantly, the IEA and in a, I will say, in a fairly major way, the NRC. Uh, the global approach to nuclear safety regulation is timely at this time because of the incipient global renaissance in nuclear power. Uh, and that concludes my, uh, my presentation. I just want to mention that uh, these, for those who want to learn more about the accident in Chernobyl and all of the topics we've been talking about today, uh, those are some uh, uh, websites, uh, IEA websites, that have a plethora of information. Thank you very much. I've certainly enjoyed this, and I've enjoyed being here.